that's helpful. Yes, please, uh, okay. please do. Okay, sounds great. Uh, welcome to the regular scheduled uh, meeting of the Collection Service Board. Um, the, let me go ahead and read the notice of the meeting and then we'll get uh, we'll get started. Notice of May 8, 2019 meeting of the Collection Service Board meeting was posted to the Collection Service Board website on May 1, 2019. Um, if I may, we'll go ahead and take, uh, uh, take roll. Uh, Bart Howard? Present. Steve Harp? Here. Josh Holden? Present. Chip Pellman? Angela Hoover? Uh, Chair, we do have quorum. Uh, since we are uh, doing a teleconference, we'll have to read the statement of necessity, and then everyone please keep in mind that as a result of a uh, teleconference, we always have to do a roll call vote um, uh, throughout every any sort of action item from there forward. Um, so without further ado, according to TCA 844-108-B2, if a physical quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, the governing body must file such determination of necessity, including the recitation of the facts and circumstances on which it was based, with the Office of Secretary of State no later than two working days after the meeting. Furthermore, TCA 844-108-A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at that meeting require timely action by the body that physical presence by a quorum of the members is not practical within the period of time requiring action and that participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communications is necessary this is the regular scheduled meeting for the collection service board and the purpose of today's meeting with one of the members attending by teleconference is to discuss the agenda as noticed on the website earlier um, if I may, I'd like to entertain a motion to accept that statement of necessity as our statement to be filed with the Secretary of State. Do we have such a motion? So moved. Uh, second. All right. Mr. Holden give, gave us a motion, and Mr. Harb gave us a second for a roll call vote then. Mr. Howard? Aye. Mr. Harb? Here. Mr. Holden? All right. Yes. All right. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, not here. Yes. Yes. I already said yes. You were voting present then, right? Yeah, I was voting <laughs> present, but I'm okay with the, 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 uh, the a uh, very controversial yeah. statement there. It was. <laughs> it was. All right. Very well, then. That, that's been approved. We'll file that with the Secretary of State within the next couple of days then. Um, we'll move on then to our agenda. Um, anyone have any comments on the agenda or any edits that they'd like to make? Uh, if they do not, then we'll entertain a motion to, um, to accept the agenda. Move to accept the agenda as presented. Mr. Harb has given us a motion to accept the agenda as uh, presented. Do we have a second in that regard? Second that motion. Mr. Holden has given us a second um, for a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Howard? Aye. Uh, Mr. Harb? Aye. Mr. Holden? Aye. All right, very well. The agenda has been accepted then. Um, we will proceed with the agenda as written. Um, if we can, let's move to the uh, February uh, minutes. I know uh, everyone's had an opportunity to, or it's been, that's been sent to everyone. I trust everyone's had an opportunity to look at that. Um, are there any comments or any edits that would uh, be su suggested or recommended? Okay. O only, uh, only a question that I have, uh, Glenn. Yes, sir. Has, uh, has it been discussed with the administration of whether or not we're going to be able to go to the NACARA meeting? It it uh, it has, um, and um, right now we just we're waiting on the information. I've got to send up the uh, um, I've got to send up the uh, uh, a travel authorization, but right now there doesn't seem to be any resistance. Of course, if that changes, I'll keep the the board and uh, you updated as well. But right now, as soon as that agenda is released, we'll file that that travel authorization and then move it up the chain. One other question: Has has there been any discussion about? Uh, the Collection Service Board becoming members of the NACARA or, or uh, uh, NMN, NMMO or uh, the NMLS system, as you're referring to, yes, sir. Um, uh, there hasn't been any further discussion. Um, of course, uh, the the uh, information making that case was memorialized. I believe it was either April or February of uh, last year, but um, no further discussion at this at this time. Okay, uh, I don't know when it's appropriate or even if it is appropriate but if it is then we might want to mention that uh we we're having difficulty getting collection agencies that are licensed in other states to pay their their uh their fines or fees in in this state because there's no there's no uh, repercussions if they don't if we were members of the of the uh, mls system then we would we would be able to put that on on their record, and then when they applied for their license in their home state, it would it would show up that they're not paying us. I, I think we would. I think 
our collections would do much, much better if uh, if we were a member of that NMLS. Ask a question, Bart. What restrictions are there in being a member? What what hoops do we have to jump through to remain a member? Any s additional disciplines? Uh, there, there there is not. Um, we um, uh, council, myself, Roxana, and. Um, uh, I believe there was one other. Yes, Asia uh, went down and uh, reviewed the, uh, the the requirements. We went down basically to the Tennessee Tower of Financial Services. They're using NMLS right now. Uh, matter of fact, they are, and so is Department of Revenue. And so um, it's there's not like a uh, a member fee. I believe there's like an application fee, but then that's passed on to the uh, to the applicant to the licensee. Uh, and it was nominal uh, for what we because we, we had that discussion. We didn't want anything that would be overly burdensome because that becomes the the uh, the obvious concern. And at that time, we didn't feel like there was anything like that would prohibit or would raise any red flags in that regard. So we felt pretty comfortable with with that with that structure. But uh, no, there's no sort of we don't provide them reports on a regular basis of our activity or anything like. They that. can provide reports from that. They, they no, can, do we provide them? No, reports, we do not. No. But they can provide us reports. They can. If we were in the okay. system, they can. Uh, we can cater reports. They have a help center, mm -hmm. an IT and uh, business analyst support center, which is one of the other benefits that we 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 liked as well because we can augment our staff um, exponentially with that with their own uh, with their own staff uh, NMLS staff. But they can run you know reports catered to whatever you really need. Sure. And that, that's a good point, uh, Bart. I'll I'll, I'll uh, send a, a memo up to up the chain uh, just to kind of remind them that that was a, a concern or uh, from the board. I can't uh, I can't think of any good reason why we shouldn't, but uh, uh, there has been some pushback from the administration, and I'm not sure why, especially since we're using it in other parts of the uh, of the state. Uh, I'll definitely relay your concern. That that won't that that won't be a problem at all. And um, of course, uh, you know everything that we do on the record as well is captured and memorialized and um, and 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 relayed as well. But um, okay. since I know that that was a concern, I'll, I'll let them let them know in, in that that memo. Um, okay. Um, well, back to the minutes. Then um, is there a motion in the regard to accept that, or is there any edits that that would like to be um, reflected in those? I vote to accept the minutes. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Second. Holden. We have a second. We got a motion from Mr. Holden and a second from Mr. Harb for roll call vote. Mr. Howard? Aye. Mr. Harb? Aye. And uh, Mr. Holden? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's been approved then. We'll move on to the director's report. Um, one thing I would like to, to bring up, since I was going to bring it up later, but since we're having that, this that we were since you brought up NMLS and uh, collecting fees, we've had that discussion before. Don't we don't necessarily there's no new information except for um, from the fines imposed and collected. Um, only 1,500 remain uncollected from in-state actors, of which 1,000 was due to unlicensed activity. I found that very because we were we we're trying to figure out if it was out-of-state actors or in-state actors. Um, the majority of outstanding fines is due to out-of-state agencies. The vast majority. It was overwhelming. Right. There's no action we can really take, is there, on the out-of-state agencies? Can we, as a board, do we? Can we contact their board, their licensing group, and say, "Hey, we got a bad actor in your state," or is that appropriate? We don't typically do that unless there's like a letter of good standing or something like that. There, that's being requested, and then that, and then of course, it would have to be disciplinary action. You know, then that we would report that'd be part of a letter of good standing, but that would be the extent of it. That, that that's a, that's the main advantage that I see in belonging to, to uh, NMLS is that that would be a matter of record, and and uh, without having to make a specific write a letter or make a specific request. That is good. And uh, Bart, uh, since as you as you were discussing that and brought that up, that that'll be the point that I'll uh, focus on. That it seems that you want that um, that seems to be of uh, particular interest to you. So I'll make sure to include that. Okay, very well. Um, then we'll move on to the uh, budget report. Then, if we can, um, let's take a look at that. This will just be for informational purposes. We did the deep dive at our last meeting. The, we looked at the fiscal health, the overall fiscal health, the reserves. Uh, we looked at the expenses as well, and we looked at all the trending through, um, I believe, December. So we're only looking at January through uh, March primarily. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time here. I'll, of course, entertain any questions if the, if the board has any. But uh, I didn't see anything outside the ordinary. Uh, it looks like 
Um, we'll just look at March last month. We were in a surplus of 15,000. And then for the, uh, for the uh, year, we're looking at revenues of 186 with, uh, with uh, expenses of 85. So we're running a, a net surplus overall for this fiscal year of 101. Now that's a far cry from where we were uh, just about a year ago. Remember all that red we were looking at? Yeah. So um, we've come a long way. And so we're looking pretty good. I didn't, uh, looks like from the accounts, everything was tracking. I didn't see any, anything out of the ordinary or that, that needed an explanation other than, you know, some of the expenses we had for that were passed, of course, to all the boards when we did some enhancements through core, uh, through a vendor. But other than that, and that was, that, that had an explanation, of course, that all the boards shared in those expenses. But other than that, that's, that's all I've seen. Um, unless there's any other questions, then we'll we'll move on. But I'll just pause for a moment to entertain any of those if you had any. Is that 101 points net ahead from the deficit in the past, the end year to date. Um, it does. Uh, we've got a. I, I don't have the. Uh, I don't no, have I, the result. Just, just as long as we're positive. Yeah, well, we were already. I think we had a, a, a positive reserve of several hundred thousand dollars oh, already. Okay. So, so that'll be on top of that. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're, we're in good stead. Um, so yeah, that definitely negated. We need to party. I, I think so. Right. We we plugged the holes at least. I was proud about that. I was very thankful for that. When you when you see a leak in the boat, you know, yeah. And so we we definitely put the cork in there, and uh, we're we're doing okay now. All right. Um, okay. Let's just get on with the uh, with the license exemption discussion and the change of ownership discussion. Uh, we've had some uh, some vendors that work for their clients for they're just compliance uh, uh, vendors who are do a lot of the licensing uh, and so they've had I think a lot of similar questions so we've been seeing an uptick in the questions as it pertains to uh, exemptions and as it pertains to a change of ownership uh, we'll start with the, the first one um, one was uh, our mortgage notes exempt um, basically mortgage service providers are they are would, would they uh, be exempt um, this this is far I, I think that uh, let me turn this let me turn my speaker off here sorry I think that um, that um, uh, an exemption is is uh, is is fine if it, it, are you questioning whether they're exempt because they are are a mortgage company or a mortgage servicer or is it the same? I think if they're collecting on notes, that was really the the, the issue. Is um does the event does the exemption apply to notes? Now you know the exemptions we have typically are, are already expressly implied uh, under exemptions. You know, we typically direct people to those, but um, some of the language that might be sparse there. Um, well, what's the what's the difference in collecting notes and uh, and a bank turning over notes to Steve to collect? Uh, under um, Steve, Steve, has, Steve has to have a license uh, to collect notes just mm -hmm. like he does hospital bills. Right. Um, it's and that that answer might be there is no exemption. You know that might very well be the answer. But under uh, 622102 chapter definitions, it says collection service does not include any person that engages in or attempts to engage in the collection of notes or guarantees. So that was the that was the hang up. That be third party person. Note not a debt. Seems like it's a. Well, you prove a debt in court is with a note. Well, not the only way, but it's the very essence of debt. It's good debt. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think there should be an exemption, but but I don't want to uh, overrule what the statute says. Ask the director a question while while that while everybody's mulling that. Do we does the does the board or do we give advisory opinions on these issues in response to the inquiries? Is that? I mean, it's a legitimate question, but I guess what what has been the precedent for that? What what has been done in the past in terms of giving? Lynn, you can correct me if I'm wrong. To my knowledge, uh, the board does not give advisory opinions. Usually when those questions come in, uh, Glenn and I will kind of discuss and we will let them know that, you know, this is what the statute says. We kind of direct them to the law and rule. Um, 
if they have a specific question about their issue rather than an advisory opinion, we'll bring that question to the board. Uh, I think in the, our, um, at the time, um, there was a there was a the, the model description that they that they were under that this particular provider was under um, they uh, it was more third party so I think it, it was exempt anyway um, but it was uh, the exemption may apply as the loans were considered notes under that model but in gen generally speaking um, you know we didn't want to just apply that broadly without talking to the industry experts so. Um, I ask you a question. If I purchased notes from anybody, a jewelry company, a bank, savings and loan, a school, if I purchased a note and it was a real note signed and they were made payments on it, and I was collecting on that note, well, as a third party or as a debt purchaser, I'm not collecting debt at that point? I, I think so, Steve. I do too. I've, I've, because how can because it's a note, that's not debt. As a debt collector, as long as I make no attempt to collect, I don't have any license. So if I put everything out, but what you're saying is, is that would be an exemption to the ha not have to be licensed if a debt buyer buys notes. They can do something on them, and they're not. Well, a, a, dead buyer, dead, a dead buyer does not have to be licensed, but if he attempts to collect the debt, then he has to be licensed. But if, he, if it's just a debt buyer, he makes an investment and hires a collection agency or a lawyer to do the collection work for him, that, that buyer Bart, does not have to be licensed, sir. Bart, yes. a debt collector buys the notes, and if a note's not a debt, it doesn't matter if the debt collector calls on it or not, because he's not calling to collect debts. And attempting to collect the debt, he's attempting to collect a note. So that that's that's a, a real contradiction to me. But uh, Bart, Steve, let, let me weigh in, and we may need to get counsel on this. But it, it, just from from my little bit of research that I did in preparing for this, it looks like this provision that they're relying on in sixty two twenty one zero two three regarding the definition of collection service and it says it does not include a person that engages in the collection of notes or guarantees that was added in 2014 it's a new provision and so that was plugged in it's been tacked on to the existing definition at the same time that was added 6220-124 was also amended and if you look at subsection B of 124 it says a collection service licensee may commence litigation for the collection of an assigned note. Well, how do you read those two consistently? Collection service does not include any person that attempts to engage licensee may commence litigation on a note. I don't know that you can read those two things harmoniously. Maybe you can, and I'm, I'm missing it, and I'd open myself up to criticism. But, but on the second thing you read, if you're not collecting a debt, a licensee can not collect debt and, and, and talk to somebody. So if it's not a debt, but a debt collector's, I mean, a licensee's collecting it, okay. You know, you. you there's not much a licensee would attempt to collect that one would not construe as a debt, except well, now a note's not a debt. I, I will just say as far as um, <clears throat> Part 124, that's no longer in the statute. That's actually been transferred out. So 127 now, or where's that at? Um, let's see. At conditions of assignment? Yes. Yes, that's 127 now. 127 now, okay. Is the question then, uh, uh, we as a collection service board don't license people that just collect notes, even though they're delinquent and uh, they're getting a fee for it and they're collecting in the name of a third party, but since it's a note and not a debt, and I don't understand the difference, but are we saying that they don't have to be licensed? 
that, that, think, that is that's the way I read the statute. Um, I, I agree. I think that's what the statute says. Mm -hmm. If you're collecting on a note, you don't have to have a license. The, even though 127B, I, I think it says that a collection service may sue on a note. So I, I guess the answer, the short answer is, I think if you're suing on a note, you don't have to have a license. Yeah. yeah. But uh, su suing and collecting are those different things. I, I know you can sue without being a collection agency, but if if I if I write a letter and say, Billy Bob, you owe me some, you you owe this note, and it's delinquent, and I want my money, and this is X Y Z company. I, XYZ company does not have to be licensed. A, a cautious debt collector would send a 30-day a, a letter out in advance of even be, beginning to sue on a note. And so... That, what, what we're saying is he doesn't even have to be a debt collector. Uh, so yes. It can, be, it can be anybody anybody walking up and down the street can collect notes. So it could be a debt buyer that makes no attempt to collect debt without a license, but he can collect notes. Oh, that's goofy. That doesn't sound. That doesn't sound right. Uh, would it be Would it be appropriate to ask the attorney general for an opinion on that? Um, if If the board elects for me to do that, I can formulate that, those questions and and get that routed and get that started. But what do you think, the rest of the board? Do you think that that's appropriate at this point? Because I'm certainly confused. Well, how would it cause a problem? If somebody only collects notes, they don't have to be licensed. If they collected an open account receivable or a credit card, credit card's not a note. Uh, it, well, it's, it's still a debt, though. Well, it's not a note. It's still a debt. A note's a very specific thing, isn't it? A, 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 note, a note is a promise to pay. Uh, that's that's the defining characteristic. In writing? Every, every, yeah, every, well, yes. A note should be in writing, yes. Um, but every note, that is that is the commonality among all of them, is that at some point they say, "I promise to pay." Um, well, if you go to the if you go to the hospital and check in, they they have you sign a little thing that says, "I promise to pay." And and if you don't, is that a note or is that a debt that you owe the hospital? True. It, it, and, and you make a fair point, Bart. At some point, it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between an account and a note because you're right an, an open trade account for instance uh, is is an is a debt obligation there's no question there's an indebtedness there but I don't think we would normally regard that as a note unless you signed an invoice that had the words I promised to pay on it well, then or signed a receipt when you, when you when you apply for a credit card you 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 uh, you do that too you you promise to pay the credit card bills you just haven't uh, you just haven't executed all the money off of your note yet. Uh, I, I, I can't. I guess there are uh, instances when a debt is not a note. Uh, a well, it, agreement, you know, I, there's a lot of debt that's not a note because if you don't say I promise to pay, but I, I guess I wonder why in the world was that put in there? I mean, I uh, how did that like get in the law? Sounds like a dead buyer wrote it. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I, I want to say that there was some litigation at that time in 12, 13, 14, uh, and, and this, this, was an, this was an issue, and that that change in the statute was the legislature's response. Don't, don't know that for certain, but I know that there were contemporaneous cases that, that preceded this change that I, I think were probably the catalyst. For making that, you asked what's what's the what's the purpose of it? I think the purpose has to be to limit the number of entities or individuals uh, subject to licensure. You've, you've exempted not only those that are in collecting notes, but also guarantors or, or collect you're collecting well, on a guarantee of a debt. That one's tacked on there as well. That's, even, that's another one. Yeah. That's another so. One. So it doesn't even have to be a note if you guarantee the lease and you're collecting on a guarantee. The lease is not a note. Correct. And you're, then you're, you're not a debt collector. Correct. Collecting yeah. on leases. If or, someone is guaranteed a lease. Yeah. That would be yeah. a, a financial obligation. I agree. It's it's not a note. But if you collect it on the person who defaulted on the lease, 
that's a debt. But you collect on the guarantor, you collect on the guarantee. I think that's, that's an interesting debt. distinction because if you that's if it's the crazy. the uh, lessee, then you need a license. But if it's the guarantor, yeah. So to get to the guarantor and talk to the lessee, you have to be licensed. But once you go after the guarantor, well, now I have seen offers from people just to sell instruments, to, just to sell guarantees, basically. Well, and it, it could be that the legislature intended the word guarantee to modify the word note to be to say notes or guarantees and maybe they meant to say guarantees of notes i don't know I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud i'm not in their shoes speculating further just speculation sounds like a real good lobbyist had a guarantor who paid a lot of money to have that put in <laughs> that's crazy that that contradicts the entire basis of, of our licensing. Yeah. I, I'm going back, Steve, and you remember it to the, uh, I can't remember the name now, but the, the uh, uh, at the at the Bristol Speedway. Yeah, those people came and presented to us. Yeah. Their attorneys came in. Yeah, that's the case I was thinking about, too, because it was a note and it was a guarantor in that case. That, that's exactly right. And yeah. It's almost like they didn't like what happened and so they got it changed. Mark, that is exactly on point of what they came with their problem and because the guarantor and the guy didn't want to pay up. Well, I'll be darned. Well, it looks like, <clears throat> the, the, um, if I, unless I'm mistaken, it looks like there is a, a general consensus and it was with, um, with, um, with administration and council as well that um, license exemption would apply to mortgage notes and just notes in particular um, as it pertains to the um, <clears throat> the carve out in that definition. Um, so th I think we just wanted to, to hear from the board making sure that we did our due diligence and we weren't missing some sort of nuance in the industry that could upend that that sort of consensus. But it, uh, I, I, I haven't heard anything yet. Now, the logic of it can be debated obviously for you know uh, why it's there or you know, you know how that impacts the industry. There's definitely it creates some confusion, no doubt about that. Um, in the legal report in the future, if someone makes a complaint, do you all have to determine if it's a note or a guarantee they're complaining on? And if it is, their their complaint's null and void because there's no there's no collection, no licensing requirement. So everybody that <coughs> complains about somebody trying to collect on me, if it happened to be they were trying to collect on a note, I think in, in the past couple of years I've only seen one where they involved a guarantee um, so it's but not a question that what about a note it could be but you never ask is this a note or just an account it, it I don't think it's one of the questions that our centralized complaint folks That's true. currently That's true. ask yeah, they me. just you know they just see an agency on the other side that is you know based on what the complainant or the consumer has sent it appears to be a collection agency and then if you know we can match that up with a license then we know they're a collection agency or, or if it's unlicensed we can just treat it as unlicensed uh, collection activity but I don't think you know, to answer your question that's not one of the criteria that currently are centralized as a board we couldn't find somebody who was collecting on notes and a complaint was against them even if the, the, the respondent didn't respond and it was a note. So do we have a duty to determine everything they complain about is a note or not a note? Did it say I promised to pay at the hospital and that's a note? Or I signed for my child to get into the hospital so I'm a guarantor. Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. Or my wife to get into the hospital. In fact, it does say at the hospital I guarantee the debt of or the, 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 the account of. Yeah. And, and on the other end of the spectrum, if all of a sudden that that agency doesn't have to be licensed what are, what are they gonna you know, how, how much how much pandora box is, is going to escape that it could be half of the complaints we look at could be on notes yeah. and we really shouldn't be finding anybody that didn't attempt to collect the debt and that's very possible right now though the the only the only uh, place that 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 question's coming from is mortgage service providers right now that's that's the only thing we've seen thus thus far it hadn't caught fire yet that's possible yeah it hadn't caught fire uh, I, 
I don't know. Is 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 it time to ask the question of the attorney general? What that means, and or or do, would we rather not rattle the box? Okay, yeah. If um, if you would like an opinion from the AG's office, then we could uh, we could definitely pursue that. Is, that. is that something that the board uh, is interested in, Bart? I, I think so. Okay. Would you like to make a motion in that regard? Because we'll have to, of course, you know, uh, craft a question. We'll, yeah, we'll have to craft the question for the uh, for the AG's office. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd, I'll make that motion. Bart, Bart, if I can ask you, this is Ashley. Um, if I can ask you, what specifically are you seeking clarification from the AG's office on? Okay. I don't have a copy of the statute that y'all are reading from that, that says notes and guarantors and so forth. But I think that that's I, what I want to know is if a, if a, a note or a guarantor is no longer regulated by the collection service board. Posture the question: If if someone complained about a note, could the board take action since they were collecting on a non debt, and see if the AG says we can take action against? someone who didn't respond appropriately. Were you looking for clarifiers as to what that well, note entails? that would give right, an example. Right. No, I mean, I think Josh just told us, if it says I promise to pay and you sign it, it's pretty much a note. Is that correct? So, so, the, so the, only, the only hesitation I have with, with your particular question, Steve, um, that I can see because the statute does specifically say that collection services doesn't include the collection of notes um, or guarantees. I would say when we receive a complaint and we get a response, I think at that point when Dennis looks at that information, if it appears to be a note or if he has question about it, he'll send out an investigator and from there he makes that determination. Um, I'm not sure what what clarity, because um, if, we, if we get the determination that it is a note, Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong, that would be something that you would close because you would say that it's, right. it, it didn't have to be licensed right. anyway. Um, so I guess I guess my confusion is if, if it appears that we already have the answer to that, what are we asking the AG's office about, about collecting notes if the statute does say that it doesn't include notes as a collection service? Right. It is pretty clear on the face. Right. I mean, where's the question? Yeah, I see what you're saying. And ask him, do you really mean this? No, we can't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Having to make some distinct, I guess, a distinction right. between is it a, <clears throat> is it a guarantee, you know, under the statute, is it a guarantee or, or a note? Is that something as simple as maybe the example of going to the hospital and signing, I promise to pay? Or I guarantee my child's death. Yeah. Because when you sign as a parent. It doesn't say that you can't collect it. It just it just says that the collection service board doesn't doesn't regulate those people. And it, it may be worthwhile to I mean as as it's written, I think it is clear. But what about third party notes? Is is this is the statute referring only to collect? Party and still be exempt. If you're collecting your own notes, your first party, and you don't have a problem anyway. I understand. Yeah, I understand. So, well, that's it, a good point. Yeah, I mean, so it, yeah, it but, must be by, by implication it, referring to third it, party. Yeah, it could only be because it, sure. it's not being collected on. Yeah. So, but if Steve goes, at, if Steve buys some buys some notes on the open market, and buys them, he can collect them without having a license. Oh, Five hundred of them the other day, <laughs> all notes. And I know that I'm not allowed, well, I didn't used to be allowed to attempt to collect anything under the under my company. I referred 100% of it out for collection. But now you're telling me I could collect on it myself if I wanted to? I, I don't want to, but that, that yeah, confounds that, me. That's, that's it's what it never is. been that way. It's just crazy. That's half, of the, that's half of the business in the real world that debt agencies work on. A note of some type or a guarantee of some type. Now, I'll, I'll bet you that that you could you could attribute that to credit cards too, because when you sign that, that's a that's a promise to pay. 
obviously have to get an opinion on that if you've signed for the card, but does it say I promise to pay? I don't know. But if, if, you're, if you have a spouse on the account, you're a guarantor of the spouse's charges. Because yeah. the, the definition of guarantor is probably a lot looser. As long as you agree to take on someone else's debt, then you're a guarantor, I guess. I don't know the legal definition of anything. The only, the only thing, is, the only thing is a, as a board, I don't feel comfortable fining people for violating our statute if they're, if they're exempt. And they don't even know they're exempt, but and so they've been they bought a license, they've been buying licenses for years, and now the law has changed, and they don't know they're exempt. Do, do I feel comfortable uh, imposing the statute on them when what they've done is not is not a violation? Mark, one question beyond that: Do we, as a board, have a duty to determine if it's a note before we impose anything? Because if it's a note. We can't do anything if we don't know it, and we and we go after somebody. Is it now? You can ask the AG that. Is it our duty to find out if it's a note? That'd be one of the questions. Because if we have to determine it's a note before we find anybody, well, I'll just stop. So, um, in an effort to, to amend and craft that motion, Bart, um, what we're asking the AG's office then, and if I can just sort of uh, summarize, is that you're looking for clarifiers as to what actually constitutes a note, because we know it's exempt. So, we're looking for clarification beyond the obvious, you know, mortgage notes, um, and what, what what does that entail beyond that? And then also, um, do we do, is there a duty owed to um, to um, verify whether or not it in fact is a note, or does that burden fall upon the uh, the the um, the, um, the, parties involved. the parties involved in the complaint? Is that is that the motion? I, I, I think that sounds yeah, that's a good motion. That's okay. Um, do we have a, a second in that regard then? Second. Uh, Mr. Harb is seconded it uh, for roll call vote. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Harb. Aye. Mr. Holden. All right. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Well, um, as soon as we get an update on that, we'll let you know uh, what we hear. Okay. Um, we'll, mo we'll move on to the next item then. Um, commercial debt collections. guys got to talk into your microphone or I can't hear you. Oh, that's okay. I'm just gra uh, grabbing my bearings right quick. Okay. I think the short of that question was... So the, 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 the long of the, the, or excuse me, the short of the long is, um, you know, uh, our, our inclination... Well, I don't. I won't try to, to steer. So I'll try to be careful with the way I say. But I, we do got a position on this. But we want to make sure that it's in line with the industry. Um, the person collecting uh, debt typically, unless they fall into those exemptions or otherwise defined, you know, they have to get a uh, they have to get a license. You know, that's that's just basic. Um, we had one question come in about: Is there any exemption for commercial debt collectors? And um, the uh, the uh, uh, well, I'll just pose that question first, and then I'll kind of give you what I what I said then, because I don't want to steer any. Uh, but um, well, okay, uh, maybe something you. Want, I asked man. that question in the meeting a while back. I thought yeah. uh, commercial paper was exempt, and and I was told in the meeting that commercial paper is a debt, and you're collecting on a debt. Yeah. Uh, that was our position. As yeah, well. I mean that's that. yeah. To me, it seemed very simple, but uh, the, where where they um, where they tr were taking it was um, not a consumer, uh, right? They were trying to to say that they're they're not a consumer, um, and that also the debt means any obligation or obligation of a consumer. So they're really focusing on consumer. However, if they were, uh, my response to them at the time was, uh, and based on uh, recommendation from counsel, was go further in that chapter. Because uh, the other parts of that paragraph, paragraph six and seven, states that collection service has the same meaning as collection service under TCA 6220-102. Well, you read collection service, and it says means any person that engages in or attempts to engage in the collection of delinquent accounts, bills, or other forms of indebtedness 
irresponsive of whether that person engaged in or attempted to engage in the collection activity has received the indebtedness by assignment or or uh, was purchased by the person engaging in. Sure, the long is there's nothing in there about consumer. But what you just read sure is contradicted by this uh, notes that is not counted. I mean, does that cover notes in that broad language, or does this exempt notes? That, that, that definition, the, the next sentence of that definition is where we get the the collection service does not apply to notes or guarantees. So the entire definition is, it includes both of those. Yeah, taken as a whole. That That's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeah, so when uh, Glenn... When Glenn and I talked about it, I told him I saw nothing in the statute or the rules that differentiated, um, that parsed out commercial debt. Um, I felt that it fell under the the definition and it required a license, but we wanted to bring it to the board for your opinion. I took a quick look at it. I'd be inclined to agree. I didn't see any distinction between commercial and consumer uh, uh, under 62. The, the board has taken that position in the past that that uh, a debt's a debt whether it's a consumer or or, or a commercial account. Sorry right for the pause. I'm just making sure I note that because I, I promised these applicants that I would get back to them. Um, we felt that's probably what where the board would go on that. That that wasn't necessarily as you know controversial or required any sort of extra expertise necessarily. But and again, one to do our due diligence, the industry is a little bit more nuanced than maybe some of the others so we wanted to make sure that we we had you folks uh, weigh in so uh, I think that there's a broad consensus there so we'll, we'll just respond accordingly that'll be that'll be fine thank you for your input I appreciate that okay all right we'll move on to the next item um, change of ownership discussion um, per uh, per rule um, let me get my, my information for that one Yeah, the, the scenario is, is, as, is like this. Company A owns Company B. Another outside company, Company C, buys Company A, thereby becomes the direct owner of Company B. Are they subject to a, a new application because there's been a change in ownership or other member interests? Because the rule states that if there's a change of ownership of 50%, that they, it requires a, a new license. So if one company owns another, but an outside un unaffiliated company comes in and buys company A and then thereby ends up the owner of company C, their holdings, you know, there technically has been a change in ownership on that level, but there hasn't been um, uh, a direct change because you still have the owners of company C. Uh, so there's just been one more layer added. The application, you have to affirm as an owner or majority owner of a company that you, you're not felon or anything like that so if if I wanted to own an agency I would just form a company and let it buy an agency even though I was a felon and now I have a license I don't think so seems like you'd have to apply that was also our position <laughs> I, I I'm, trying, I'm trying real hard not to steer you know because I really do want your uh, your your position but that was also our position as well um, primarily because the, the 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 language there was ownership or member interest so yeah, you could argue indirect, direct all day long, but there's a member interest there. If I just bought a company, I've got interest, that, and and there is ownership too. That's very real. Uh, so, um, and because of the the background and checks as well, we didn't want uh, there to be any sort of loopholes inadvertently created as a result of the way we apply that. Ownership changes in the licensee more than fifty percent. Yes, sir. Yeah, then have to apply. Any other comments on that? I have a question. Just if if it changes less than fifty percent twice in one year, do you have to apply, or every other year? Less than or more than? Less than fifty percent. No, we don't have any okay. any rules distinguishing that. Company A is owned by this felon, and he buys forty five percent. Next year, he opens another company, and he buys another 45%. Neither one caused a change in license, and the felon now controls and owns the company through the parent. 
that would be a uh, that would be based on indirect ownership what we described today that would be more than 50 percent at that point well n no because it changed in the, in a year uh, is it ever uh, changed uh, he bought in the, six see. months later okay year in passes he opens right. a new company and that new company buys another 45 percent so now two companies own 45 percent each but since he owns both of them he controls them because he has 90 percent of the company in your scenario, um, I, I agree with you. Um, that would not require a new application because it's less than 50% based on the language of the rule. Transaction. Yeah, it, it, the rule is based on a transaction changing 50%. But you have two transactions, you're up from under the rule. So the, the rule doesn't run from the posture of the applicant at the time it makes the application? It's, no, um, okay. so, so the rule we're discussing is um, zero. 320-01-.04 uh, part 2 which says in a corporation or limited liability company an aggregate change of 50% or more of the shares ownership or other member interests respectively that would require a new application that's how we define change of ownership that's per event without saying it yes. yeah <laughs> yeah okay I just now it's good to know that felons can own uh, control collection agencies I, I feel better and they, if they collect notes they don't have to have a license it's getting better <laughs> uh, more rule we don't need to meet <laughs> well, we're getting into the legal report next so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, th those don't require any sort of action items. The AG's opinion did, so we're, we're good as far as the board action items. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in just a short little period there. Um, so our next item then is, unless there's any uh, other questions or something that requires uh, action, uh, we're, we're going to move to the uh, legal report. And then, of course, there's always a new business. We can open up uh, whatever can of worms or that we want to do there. So. Um, um, if we will then, if it's, if it's the will of the chair and the board, we'll move to the legal report then. Let's do it. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. I'll, uh, like, typically I'll read the uh, number and the corresponding complaint number, and then at the end we'll, there'll be one uh, that we have actually labeled for discussion, so we'll have to at least discuss that one. Uh, number one, 2018-09-1251. Number two, 2019-005321. Number three, 2019 Number four, 2018 Number five, 2018 Number six, 2018 Number seven, 2018 Number eight, 2018 Number nine, 2018 Number 10, 2018 Number 11, 2018 Number 12, 2019 Number 13, 2019 Number 14, 2019 Nine one number fifteen two thousand nineteen zero zero nine three zero thousand nineteen zero one one five zero one seventeen two thousand nineteen zero one one seven five one eighteen two thousand nineteen zero one five three seven one nineteen two thousand nineteen zero one five six zero one 20, 2018 2018 We can either start out with the new cases or we got the couple of cases to be represented. And like I said, the boy, it was one of those that would require some discussion, I think. Let's uh, let's go if we can. Let's just go from from one down to okay. twenty two. Okay. Yeah. So. so, were there any questions? I I guess that's probably the best way to just open it up. I know some of, uh, I think all the new cases I've got recommendations on. So, if there are any questions on 
anything, we can discuss that now. Mark, have you read them all? I, I have read them all, and I wrote some notes yeah. down, but my uh, internet is out up here, and I can't get the, the entire question, but the notes, I have a, a note that I'd written on number one, uh, was a, I think a reply maybe we didn't get a reply right no response no response and and, and it is a um, a licensee so it's not an unlicensed situation okay and is it a, and is it a legal debt well I think sort of you know based on our, our uh, <laughs> beginning of the meeting the meeting I think that's the legitimate question uh, based on what I saw it does appear to be a legitimate debt um, you know, this is a relative. I think I put that in uh, in my summaries that the uh, licensee appears to be a recently licensed collection agency with no uh, history, so they may not. Well, you would assume they would know what to do uh, in response, but um, I think the standing position the board has been when no one responds to a verified complaint in writing, then the two hundred fifty dollars civil penalty is kind of where we've gone. I think so. Yeah, I think so too. I was going to suggest more than that, but rereading it based on our prior discussion, first sentence, the complainant financed a vehicle that was repossessed. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if you finance a vehicle, you sign a note. Right. Right. So they really weren't attempting to collect the debt, so we really can't get them. This is killing me. I mean, on the face, it has to be a note. Because you can't finance a vehicle without signing a note or being the guarantor. And I think I think here it, it's a little different because it sounds like Dennis's um, recommendation is related to failure to respond, failure to respond. and that's just an obligation they have as a licensee. They chose to get a license; they have to comply with our. They could respond rules. and you know and say, "Hey, this is a note." <laughs> if they know that <laughs> and say well, it doesn't apply, that would have been a response good enough to satisfy <laughs> us. I think. You know. but, but given that we know it's a note, are we in a position to do something for somebody who wasn't trying to collect a debt, even if they're a licensee or not? I mean, my concern in the prior conversation is, is what duty falls on us as a board not to bother somebody? Yeah, there you go. So, okay, if they don't know it, are we going to sneak by and find them? I'm not, I don't know. No, if we know what do you think? If we know that it's not part of our statute, then we don't we don't have any authority. Uh, That's correct, and I believe Dennis has, has done that a couple of times. I think he's presented a couple, or I think you said you presented one that there was a guarantee and it was a guarantee situation, mm -hmm. right? And so once that was verified, I believe you recommended closure right. on that one for because of that exemption. Now that was something that you know more than necessarily failing to respond although that might have been part of it as well but in any event um, you know the board believes that uh, given our recent conversation that we close this one I know that's oh I'd like to find them they didn't respond to us but I'm just curious if the board or well, our legal counsel feels that we have a position to find them uh, initially when we sent the first letter out there we probably shouldn't have sent it because we were we were we were asking them to respond to a, a complaint about a note. Yeah, I think their duty to respond it, it, it's regardless of what I mean we're, we're trying to gather information so they're a licensee they're, they've had an inquiry made of them they have a duty to respond as a licensee uh, yeah. this this may just be one note as part of a larger portfolio that they carry that is primarily uh, other debt obligations that are not notes and they would still need a license regardless so if they're going to be a licensee they have to respond to these kinds of inquiries the system doesn't work if they don't so I think that I, I think the, the fine is appropriate yeah. Yeah. I agree but if they responded it's a note that wouldn't change the fine because they didn't respond different, different they recommendation responded. right yeah well and that that is <laughs> Steve, that, that brings me, I, I had a question about number five, which involves a, a similar, it's a car loan, which I just realized, but it's in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. My initial question was, is the bankruptcy still going on? Was it dismissed? What happened? Um, but now that I look back, I see that it was a car loan. Again, so that, that may be a 
a relevant inquiry there is that if this is a note, um, it looks like they've responded, but I still have my, my initial question was, you know, if she got a discharge in Chapter 13, then they shouldn't be trying to collect it. If she's still in Chapter 13, they shouldn't be trying to collect it. Um, or if it's... At all. Yeah, they can try to collect it, but... Looks like it was a success or an interest, so I think it even comes makes it like it's its own debt, and so that no longer is it even a third party. It might have even been one that we might have even. I'm only thinking about it now, Glenn, but we might have even been able to administratively close it because it's one of those situations where, as a successor and interest, that basically makes you the creditor, no longer a third party situation anyway. So. I just thought if, we're, if they don't respond to us, the action of not, I, I, Josh, I agree with him. If they don't respond to us, the action of not responding, 250, at least 500, because they just need to respond to their board. Yeah. I, I agree. Just blinders on, you got to respond whether, whether, or, and, and, uh, and someone said, I don't remember who, but someone said they could just respond to it. We don't, we don't have to. We don't have to comply because this is a note. But that would have been a proper, but that would have been a response. Just to ignore us, I think they owe us a fine. Anything else for 1 through 19? I've, I've got one, a question on number four. Uh, let's see, there's a rule that uh, creditors must that creditors must hire licensed collection agencies. We we had an instance when uh, uh, it, it was it seemed like it was a Comcast or. Or uh, some, uh, a Comcast had hired an, an agency that was not a licensed agency to do collections in, in I think it was Chattanooga, and that that guy, that guy was really bad. He put a sign on his car that listed the people that hadn't been hadn't paid for their Comcast and what have you. And we went after Comcast because they hired this guy. And it seems to me there's something in our statute that says you got to hire a licensed agency. I guess that, Bart, my question would be, with, with, are you talking because this is alleged to be a robocall where it's just sort of an automated? Uh, well, I, like I say, I don't, have a cop, I don't have a copy of the entire complaint. I just have the notes that I wrote down. And I just remember, remember thinking that this, this, uh, this, li this collection agency was this collection agency was hired whoever whoever hired this collection agency is responsible for the violations of that agency that and i don't mean responsible for the violations but they they're they're obligated under our statute to hire license to hire an agency that is licensed are we saying that the the creditor who hired them would is that was that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah, yes. The creditor that hires an agency is responsible for seeing that they are licensed. Art, I wasn't familiar with that, but it sounds like we ought to be uh, anybody who hires somebody that's unlicensed. We should go after the unlicensed person and the person that hired them. Well, that's right, and it's somewhere in the statute, but I don't I don't have a copy of the statute, but it's. It's somewhere in there. I remember it happening before this Comcast deal. Well, of course, I guess the issue would be here then is just we don't know. To be honest, for this complaint, I don't think we know exactly who the who the underlying creditor, the original creditor <laughs> is. Uh, but in any event, there was no record of any licensing um, licensing for the individual or, or entity that's attempting to collect so that therefore the, the five hundred dollar 
civil penalty was um, was my recommendation. That's fine. Okay. I mean, on number nine, I, I was surprised that filing suit is not a contact, so you don't have to send out the 30-day letter prior to filing suit, if that's all you do. I just boggles my mind in a way, but that's for sure. Well, that and, and filing suit, as you know, going back to law firms being exempt, I think that nixes the issue right there. That's a good point, too. Double stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. On number 14, mm -hmm. it said expired grace. It, it was a licensee, not a licensee. The, the, the problem occurred before the license expired? That's my understanding. The, 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 um, it, right now, when, when this report was, was uh, when we produced this report, the status is currently expired grace. But at the time the complaint was made, they were still, they were still in, in a good standing. Of course, that they still would have 60 days, I believe, that they could, they could operate under an expired grace. Well, not necessarily yeah. that they can operate under. Um, they have 60 days past their expiration date that they don't have to reapply for a license. Correct. That's what grace period is. But in this instance, they were still, you know, um, it looks like that the license expired 12 31 2018. So the attempt to collect was made before 12 31 18. So they were active at the time of the activity, Correct. but they are expired now. as of the time of the complaint. Right. Okay. And at the time the report was put together. So that's okay. why you all see expired grace. you said you had um, a couple that were pri prime for discussion well there was one that we that definitely was um, was in need of some discussion and that's the the number 20 the first case under cases to be re presented uh, this is one just to sort of jog everyone's memory we had maybe seen it at the um, not the February but maybe the the meeting prior to February of 19 a complaint that um, dealt with a company that or entity that assists exclusively chiropractors in getting paid now, I'm, I won't use the term collection just yet but um, and we sent an investigator out and that's what's pushed this complaint uh, to this meeting and the the new information of course, is on page 12 there, about midway down. Um, our investigator found that, w without question, that this 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 respondent, this entity who's assisting chiropractors, files medical liens left and right. I believe that there were our investigator not got no fewer than 20 from them from separate accounts. Um, and something that's not in the report that I neglected to put in there that has, I think is important, is that one of the injured parties, one of the, because this, this complaint was filed originally by one of the injured party's attorneys, by their plaintiffs, by the plaintiff's counsel. And that individual said they've never received any kind of correspondence or phone calls from this respondent. So what we have is this, this entity that says they essentially help them get paid, help the, the chiropractors get paid, and they do, they, as part of this assistance, they file medical liens, but we don't appear to have any other, that we know of, any other correspondence or phone calls that are outgoing where that someone would be making 
the representation that they're trying to collect on behalf of the, chi the chiropractor. Um, and I will tell you that I, it's my view that filing a medical lien by itself doesn't necessarily make you a debt collector, but the end result, and this is sort of where I come down, the end result is you're attempting to, to secure payment for a third party. And it's not, it's not the chiropractor filing the medical lien. It clearly is this respondent who's doing it. Um, it's kind of like the form of a suit, a medical lien is not a contact? A medical lien, well, that's the, you, can, you file it in the, in the circuit court where the lawsuit is pending. Or if it's not pending, you, file, you, you can file a medical lien even without think you can file one without a lawsuit being filed but typically there always is a, an accompanying lawsuit that way the clerk knows that it corresponds to you know case number one two three four five um, but the medical lien is not sent to the patient you know to the if you want to call them a debtor it's not sent to the debtor so the only way that this person would even know there's a medical lien out there is if they did a search at the local you know clerk's outstanding liens in their name uh, it's not filed on the property it may make a distinction between you know like a lien or judgment lien this is no, there is no judgment these are just medical liens that are that are they're creatures of statute you know there's Tennessee law that's in another part of our our law that addresses medical liens and how they're done and these and, and these medical liens are done from what I can tell I did a little bit of digging and they're done in compliance with the statute um, but they are not sent to the individual debtors, if you will. Oh, three things stand out here as I hear you talk about the medical lien. I mean, number one, it is against the res, this, this, this proceeds of a lawsuit that the injured person would be entitled to. So they're doing that. They, they say they're doing that. They're filing medical liens. Number two, they say, they quote, assist with collection. That's what they say they do. They say they assist with collection. They file medical liens. And then number three, they're paid, and this is what they say, they're paid with a percentage of the collected funds on open accounts. So you're, you're filing a lien. You say you're assisting with collections, and you're paid based on what you collect. Now looking back at our definition section, that sure does seem like somebody who is engaging in or attempting to engage in the collection of an account. I got to ask, is it a note? Well, we don't know what the patient signs exactly. Did they come in for services with the chiropractor? They've got an injured back or neck. So we have a duty to find out if it's a note. Does our investigator have to determine if it's a note? Because if the chiropractor's thorough. He'll have paperwork just like the hospital. Says, I promise to pay or I guarantee this account. Sign up as a patient. I don't know. I'm stretching a little far, but. It is not a note. I think it would be my position that regardless of their uh, protestations and asserting that they're efficiency experts or whatever it is, right. they sure do seem like they're engaging in, in collection of uh, open medical accounts. And they're, they're doing it through a, a, a unique and ingenious way, but I think there's like that they're compensated based on how much they collect. And so then the question becomes, what's the you know the consequence we're sort of in a position where that we have i mean they're not out of business they're they're still doing business so uh, a civil penalty of x amount i don't know if that really is i mean that that's certainly warranted or you we could do that or we could give them the option to say submit a license a license application within x Hang on just a second. Uh, we just lost Bart. Um, he's going to try to call in again. It'll be just a moment. Let me put this on pause for a second. I'm not sure uh, 
how much uh, you got of uh, what I was saying, Bart, uh, but we're looking at uh, number 20 on uh, cases to be represented. Yes. I, I didn't get anything. I didn't get any of what, what we talked about. Okay. Well, I don't know how much you, you may already have a, a, a pretty good understanding. I, well, I have a list. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Go ahead with your point, please. Well, I, I go ahead and ask the questions. I think that, that we've had some discussion here uh, with the other board members, and you, you could just sort of add to that if you just want to go ahead and. Well, my, my question is, what is a medical lien? I, I know what a lien is if you sue somebody on a medical debt and you take them to general sessions court. And you get a and you win and you take a lien and you file a lien, but is there some distinction that that is there something called a medical lien and what does it mean to? Well, a medical lien is different from what you just described. A medical lien it's it's a it's a creature of of statute, but it's in another part of the you know the, the Tennessee statutes under a different uh, under a different title. But what it does it allows a Healthcare provider to file literally file this document with the, not with the register of deeds, so it's not like a lien that's going to attach to real property, but it's a lien that just basically puts um, the patient, the conceivably the insurance carrier for the patient, on notice that some healthcare provider has provided services and has not been paid, and um, it um, and as I was telling the other board members, I. Looking at these medical liens and looking at what they, what we, our investigator guide and looking at the statute, all the medical lien, lien material that we received, all is is in order. I mean, it's all, it all complies with the statute. Um, it's just a question of whether or not that you know, does that make them a a debt collector simply by filing the medical lien? I don't know that it does necessarily, but it it's all the other things that they say they be in this this particular entity. Uh, that we're looking at here. It's all the other things they say that tends to sort of, I think, sway me and apparently some of the other board members toward, you know, they are a debt collector. Yes. Yeah, I, I think they are too. And then the other part of the, of the analysis is, well, what do we do? Um, you know, and looking at discipline, yes, we could recommend or, or I mean, we could send them a consent order for whatever, or we could say, Give you know, give them sixty days, ninety days. I don't know what the reasonable amount of time on a license application would be to submit an, a license application. If they get licensed within that amount of time, then that's effectively their punishment. If you want to look at it that way, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know that just sending a consent order for you know potentially a couple thousand dollars because they they have done this over the course of clearly a number of at least a couple of years. Um, but I don't know that that would be any deterrent if they just wrote us a check to sign the consent order. They could just continue on unlicensed. But we should compel them to get a license. Have you have we had other complaints on this this creditor or a debt collector? No, this is the only one that um, that we have had. I'll defer to to uh, to the rest of the board on on what you all think. I, like I said, I don't. My internet is down here, and I don't have a, a copy of the entire complaint. I I just I was confused on what a lien is, but now now that you mention it, I do know uh, I do know what you're talking about. I would suggest a consent order with a five hundred dollar fine and require them to apply for a license within sixty days. Would that would that be reasonable? Sounds right. Yeah. That would be five hundred just flat, not not we're not talking about per per lien or, or per you know, account, but and I understand probably that might if it were only five hundred dollars, that might motivate them versus, you know, putting up a fight about paying five thousand dollars okay. and getting the license, so I, I can see it both ways. Yeah. Well, we, we've only got one one complaint in front of us, even though I, I have no doubt that they have numerous medical liens out there. Um, I think if I were their attorney, attorney, I would argue that well, we didn't have notice that and know that this was clearly something that 
fell under the, the wheelhouse of collection services, so uh, it's not really fair to punish us for things that we've done in the past. Uh, you know, em empty head, pure heart kind of defense. Yeah. Um, if, if I can just ask a, a practical question to, to the recommended discipline. Um, if this respondent pays the 500 and elect not to become licensed, um, are we still closing the further discipline? I, I think if they, if they elect not to be licensed, I mean, my, my suggestion would be if they, you know, thumb their nose at that, then um, we would need to look at their other activities. If they're going to uh, continue to operate without a license knowingly and willfully, then I, I think we would have to look at uh, you know, so, sort of further penalties. What can we do if somebody we know somebody's operating, and they continue to operate without a license, and we would believe they should be licensed? Okay. What, the, the, only thing comes to my, the only thing that comes to my mind is a is a criminal referral. Unfortunately, I mean, I think in this it's in, in there. Case, it's like a class right, C misdemeanor right, I think. for practicing unlicensed, essentially. Right. Um, I think it may be a little hard in this case because we only have the one complainant. Um, to say that it rises to the criminal level, but that that is our other option. It's not based on the complaint. It's based on their activity. Right. And they're and doing. So, a lot, so they admit they're doing I, a lot I, of activity. And I haven't seen the investigation report, so there may be other liens in that report, and we may be able to to combine all of that and refer it to to the DA local to this particular respondent. No, it's just mm -hmm. them saying we get paid based on collections. They're collecting. Sure. And everything they do is based on collections. And so, but let's hope right. they just, let's hope just they to get circle back. So we'll do the five hundred dollars civil penalty. Um, become licensed in sixty days. If they don't at that point, would you want us to just refer that to the local DA? Yeah, I think we'll get a response from them. But if they don't, if they don't in sixty days, then I think we should too. And, and it, it may be worthwhile. I'd, I'd defer to to you if whether or not it's a good idea to mention that the sixty days is more than just a suggestion. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I was going to maybe suggest a cease and desist order. And, uh, you know, if, if it was a cease and desist order from the board. Yeah. Well, the cease and desist. Them to quit doing. Yeah, cease and desist language would be part of the consent order that includes the $500 civil penalty. So um, it would be in there, uh, assuming that they do sign the consent order and then um, their signature would then evidence their their compliance and their their consent to cease and desist further activity until they're licensed. If, if they get licensed in 60 days, we're giving them grace on the cease and desist for 60 days to be licensed, I assume. They don't have to stop doing business right. for the 60 days. Right. It, well, if, whenever they sign it, I guess that the, then the the cease and desist would become effective. Well, then then we should say uh, we'll give you grace on the cease and desist as long as you're done in sixty days. Sixty days. And after sixty days, you know, come on down. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't heard the last of this one. Do you have any more notes, Bart, on any other uh, on any other the uh, of the complaints? I have I have one on twenty one. I have a question. Okay. And it's a subsidiary. Why is a subsidiary covered under a parent's license? It's a separate entity. Is it a wholly owned subsidiary, a hundred percent? Which means there's no change in ownership, kind of thing. That's the impression I got from their from their response. But, well, if, but, if you can call yourself X Y Z Company, but if you send a letter, if you are X Y Z Company, and you send a letter A B C Company, pay this bill, then then the consumer thinks it's A B C, and I don't think that they can avoid the statutes by saying, "Well, that's, that's what, we don't have to be licensed because that's just an affiliate." What you're saying, Steve? Yeah, that's that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm going. I mean, um, the company that did the actions, the one that's supposed to be licensed, just because it's got a parent that's licensed, 
when they when they signed up for their license, did they tell us that it includes their subsidiary? They're getting a license for both entities? Probably not. Doing business as, yeah. Probably. Yeah. But they say it's a subsidiary, which is not a DBA. So it just it just strikes me odd that we extend the license to another company just because it's owned. Well, and I guess the logical question is is that they could have six subsidiaries that, as far as we know, they could have any number of subsidiaries. We don't know how many different licensees can operate under under one license. That's that's not the it's it's a it's a theoretical question right now. We only know of one subsidiary, but I think that's your point is yeah. that it, and that, that sort of I think skirts the intent of the statute. Presumably, each business doing uh, debt collection should have a license. Sure, especially when you look at it in the in the eye of a consumer, he has no idea it, that this ABC company is a subsidiary of XYZ company who is licensed. That struck me. Do you have a uh, recommendation then? Because uh, right now it looks like it was uh, set to, uh, set to close. I, I, I don't. I don't think that they should be able to operate as a subsidiary. I think the subsidiary needs to have a license. I tend to agree with Bart. It sounds like they're engaging in unlicensed activity. Yeah. Um, Unless there's some sort of legal precedent that you know uh, that would uh, make it okay for a subsidiary to operate under the license of a parent, but I guess maybe given the fact that there is a license, I don't know whether and this is just a suggestion that this might be a good point for a letter of warning. I don't know, I don't know how much business they've been doing, but letter of warning in a 60 day to get your license in the subsidiary shouldn't be hard. You got a license already. And if they don't get a license in 60 days, the letter of warning gets ugly. They cease and desist. There you go. I'd support that. Okay. To, to me, if you can do a subsidiary, it's just too easy to skirt licensing and, and skirt anything you want. Yeah. A company's a com If it's a real company, if it's if it's a real company, it means not DBA. And yeah, they ought to LLC be or a corporation, yeah. right? Even if it's 100% owned. So your recommendation again was that it would uh, they have 60 days. Yeah, I'd give them a letter of warning with 60 day notice, and if at the end of 60 days they don't do it, then they'll be under a cease and desist, and we'll we'll go for it at that point for unlicensed activity. these guys I'm kind of feel like letting them off with no fine for not knowing and the other people we were going to give a $500 fine and get licensed and they didn't know either so I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with nailing one guy who didn't know and letting somebody else who didn't know off but I think in both cases after he licensed does anybody well I think I think that their that their argument is is foolish I think that they're they're just grasping the straws because they don't they want to license their parent company and don't want to license their collection agency. I, I agree with you, Steve. I think we ought to have a five hundred dollar fine for these fellows too for not not having a license and give them six, cease and desist in sixty days if you don't apply. Not much different than the other case we discussed. In, in this. I don't have any objection to that. Okay. Recommendation then on 21 would be the same as 20? Yes, sir. Uh, no, we, I think we had. That's okay. Uh, do we have any other? We weren't. We were just deliberating. Um, but the uh, do you have any more? No, I, I think you had some more notes, didn't you, Bart? Uh, just on twenty-two, uh, as maybe a maybe um, an internal thing. How, how do we? How did how did we miss the original response? That was probably something uh, in. Uh, 
something was saved maybe in an email and the email what didn't get into the complaint folder it, it literally could be something that um, perfunctory and that just when, when I look at the complaint file and there's no uh, there's no response as there is yeah. you know sometimes then the, that's where the where my inclination went to is that well they just didn't respond okay I, I understand uh, I just want I just wondered if the if the uh, um, process needed to be reviewed but, but that's okay I, I think this is the first one we've had that we didn't know that they were licensed no we didn't know that they had responded before other comments about the legal report? Okay, um, Carol, you may have to help me out in case I go go astray here, but I'll just uh, try to uh, summarize so we could do uh, one motion. Um, looks like everything um, was as recommended originally, except for number twenty and number twenty-one, which we just discussed. In which case, um, the recommendation was the same for both, and uh, that recommendation was a flat five hundred dollar fine. Uh, with instructions to get licensed within 60 days if they intend to continue uh, engaging in collection services uh, which we determined that that's what they were doing and uh, therefore if they do not seek that license in a criminal referral was that was that the understanding of the uh, of the board we don't push cease and desist for the 60 days once they sign I mean that would be right so we have basically that give grace, them grace that 60 yeah actually okay. give them a grace on the cease and desist Okay. Um, if that is the um, the motion, then and otherwise, the rest of the legal report would be accepted with those other, with with those edits, and then the recommendations made by council on the other cases. Uh, do we have a motion in that regard? So moved. We have a motion from Hol uh, Mr. Holden. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Harb for roll call vote. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Harb. Aye. Mr. Holden. Aye. All right. That uh, takes care of the legal report. Then that uh, is, uh, will those recommendations will be uh, amended. Um, if we can, we'll move to the uh, new business. Do we, have any new, do we have any new business? Anything that the board would like to discuss um, that may require the attention of the board? No? Okay. Um, then uh, we'll move to adjourn. Do we have a, a motion in that regard? So moved. We have a motion from Mr. Harb. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Holden for roll call vote. Mr. Howard? Aye. Mr. Harb? Aye. Mr. Holden? Aye. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We are adjourned. Thanks for, thanks for accommodating me, folks. Thanks, Bart. Take care. See you, Bart.